Um, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Yeah. See, you know what I like about that verse? If we strive to be sanctified, strive to be holy, then there'll be some good works for fruit. If we don't do that, there's no fruit. There's, there's, no, there's not, no good thing can come out of that. You know? So, that's a good verse. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? There you go. How much more shall the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offer himself, which he did, purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It is very dangerous for a believer to sear that conscience. Once, once a conscience is seared, it's over. The Holy Spirit can't work in that person whatsoever. So don't let yourself get to the point in your Christian walk where, where you don't listen to your conscience anymore. Because, you know, that's for, sometimes when you, you know, you know when you do wrong, okay? And sometimes your conscience tells you, don't, you know, that's where you discern whether it's the Holy Spirit telling you or your conscience. God can use both, okay? So make sure that that conscience is pure. All right, Hebrews 12, 14. Uh, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Oh, boy. You see how important living right, living a holy life is important? If we don't do it, the unsaved will not see God. Think about that. Do you realize the unsaved world, the only, the only, the only proof, the only evidence other than creation, that there's a God that loves them, is that they have to see it in us. If they don't see God living in us, they're just going to laugh at us. And some of the times, like Mike said, when they, when they pick on us, it's because maybe we're not living right, and they say, ah, look at that, hypocrite. And they have every, and they have every right to believe that. That's, that's why our testimony is so important. So important. Uh, James 4.8 Come near to God and He will come near to you. Wash your hands of sinners and purify your hearts and double mind. Okay. If we expect to draw an eye to God, then we got to clean our hands, purify your hearts. Now he's talking to who? Yeah. He's talking to believers here. He's James not. The first book of the James was the first book written. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When you when you when you open up Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First, Second Corinthians, Galatians. Okay. Uh, in the New Testament, Matthew's not the first book. Okay. The uh, people who collected the book just put them that way for some strange reason. But the first New Testament epistle written was James, and that's important. That's very important. Because James has a lot of doctrine in it. And I love to use the book of James on charismatics. Because I say to them, if speaking in tongues, if divine healings, and all that was so important, why did not James have it in the very first epistle? It's gone. There's nothing mentioned there. Why? Because the gifts had ceased by that. They were all gone. So, so it's important. Uh, listen, 2 Peter 3.14. Did I give somebody that? No, let me read it. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation? That Greek word means behavior. Behavior and godliness. See, God expects us to live like that. And it's hard. I realize it's hard. Sometimes he gets frustrated. But he expects that from us. He really does. Now, with all these verses, now do you understand in our text why it says, 
and every man hath this hope in him, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. 1 John 3.3 3. If we really love God, we're going to try to live godly lives, at least to tempt it, amen? I have more respect for a believer that is at least trying to strive for that. Yeah, he might blow it, you know, he might make some mistakes, but at least he's trying, amen? I have more respect for that than a Christian who doesn't care at all. Save, that's it. Not even trying to do anything. For I have no respect for that Christian. None whatsoever. And those are the ones that usually pick on us. So try, yeah, I know, I made that mistake. I know. And, and they point the finger, you know. we got to be careful, man. But at least strive for that holiness. All right. Any questions? All right, look at, uh, look at uh, verse 4 through 9. Verse 4 through 9. The Bible says, And whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no, one, let no man deceive you. And he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Oh boy. These verses are, are I believe, one of the most misunderstood verses in the entire Word of God. That's where they get sinless perfection here, yeah. Oh, if I'm born again, I don't sin no more. Yeah, right. Let me punch in a note and see your reaction. <laughs> Let's see how perfect you are. Or let me smash up that brand new car you just uh, bought. Let's see how you react. <laughs> All right. Notice here, in context, do we really love God? There are some tests here. And this is a very strong test in these verses. What John is going to establish here in these verses is this. If we live in sin, if we are enslaved by the habitual habits of sin, that is a clear sign that you don't love God like you should. John didn't say you're not saved. He said you're just not loving God like you should. If we have been born of God, if we have partaken in the divine nature, then we should love God to the point where we want to please Him and we want His approval and acceptance on our Christian walk. And one of those ways we can please Him is not to habitually sin. Okay? For instance, uh, when we love someone, we want to know and please that person, right? We do. We want that person's approval. We want that person's acceptance. Therefore, we do, we do everything we can to please that person. We want their love. We want their respect. God is righteous. God is pure. God is holy. There's no sin in him. Therefore, the person who loves God is supposed to strive and live a righteous and pure life. Why? Because he loves the Lord. Now, when we get into these verses, John is saying he does not live in sin. He, what he's saying is he doesn't practice the sin habitually. Now, in these, section, in, in these verses, I want us to look at uh, five things. We won't get to all five this morning. But you're going to see in verse 4 the need for deliverance. Man needs to be delivered because man is sinful, according to verse 4. Second, notice the provision for deliverance. And that provision, verse 5, is who? Jesus Christ. He took away our sins according to verse 5. And the proof of that deliverance we'll see in verses 6 and 7. 
Then we'll look at verse 8. You're going to see there the great conquest of Christ 